Welcome. Welcome to Soap Conference 2017. Now the clicker doesn't work. I tested it before the presentation, but it seems it needs more coffee. Now it works, okay. I had to wake it up. So who's on Twitter? Oh, that's great, a lot of people. So that's the hashtag and tweet like hell. You also see the tweets there. And let the world outside of that conference know what we're talking about. And all the people who were not able to attend the conference uh, who can follow the hashtag and let them know what you learn and uh, hear at the conference and how you like it and so on. And that they should come next year again. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle. at Stefan Gens. And um, I will talk about the convergence of marketing and technical communication today. So when we talk about that, it's a little bit uh, about talking about the future, because currently no one is really doing that, and no one is really uh, blending technical communication and marketing communication. And it's more like uh, we have these two silos, and pre-sales and post-sales, and we have uh, a marketing silo, and we have a technical communication silo, and they're not really connected to each other. So when, we, when I talk about that, it's a little bit uh, like talking about the future, and the future is about expectations. So when I was a child, my expectation was like becoming something like this. A cool cowboy running around shooting the evil guys. But later on I thought maybe that's not the best career path and I should become something more nicer, heroic, save little kittens from the trees and become the hero of the woman. And um, that was a better career path, I thought. And uh, the reality, of course, looked a little bit different, more like that. <laughs> so... But I liked writing, so that was fun for me, and I was doing a pupil magazine in the school and so, and I thought that's a cool thing. Uh, and later on I thought I could write, become a writer and write exciting books, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the reality looked a little bit different, more like that. <laughs> and you probably all know that. I hope no one from Philips is in the room. <laughs> okay, great, that's a Philips, Philips uh, object. And uh, is this technical communication? Or is it technical documentation, maybe? It does communicate with the customer, but does it a good job in that? Mm, I'm not so sure. I don't think so. <laughs> nice picture, I see. <laughs> so uh, I think the technical communication is changing, and uh, the people who are consuming technical documentation or technical communication are changing as well. So in the year 2000, it took about <laughs> 12 seconds. 12 seconds before the participants of the study uh, attention span, the transient attention span was over. And then they were not able to focus on that topic anymore. 12 seconds. We heard something about 25 minutes yesterday. That's a different attention span. Uh, that's the focused attention span. But the transient attention span was just 12 seconds. So um, that still felt quite long, right? When you saw these numbers going up, it felt quite long, like when it's going on, right? Um, and then you start losing your attention span. So let's mo make a fast, uh, fast move forward. 2001. 2002, LinkedIn hit the market, and it changed the way we interact with colleagues and peers and connect to them. In 2003, we got Skype and WordPress, and in 2004, we got F Facebook. It feels for me like it has been ever there, but it's just since 2004. And in 2005, YouTube hit the market. Really, was it just 2005? It feels, we're using it every day, and it feels so natural that it's there, but it's just a couple of years. And in 2006, we got Twitter, which changed the way we interact and communicate and share news and uh, uh, tweet about what we're hearing on conferences and so on. And in 2007, we got the iPhone. And in 2008, Airbnb hit the market and changed the way we book and travel, uh, book travels and uh, um, started to uh, con uh, conquer the uh, hotel market. And in 2009, we got WhatsApp. And in 2010, we got Instagram. 
I love Instagram, and we got the iPad. And in 2011, we got WeChat, which is probably currently the biggest chat module and uh, changed the way we uh, communicate instantly, quickly with each other. In 2012, I don't remember, and 2013, I don't remember as well. But then we got um, 2013, and uh, the, ch the things had changed dramatically, the way we communicate with each other, and the way we consume content, and everything went mobile, so we're, um, the majority of content that we're consuming today is we're consuming it mobile. I recently uh, looked at the Facebook page from Adobe Technical Communication, and about 60% of our users were only accessing the page uh, through a mobile device, and not even from a desktop. About 60%, that's huge. And uh, the internet has changed the way we communicate, consume, and share content, how we travel, how we buy products, and so on. But the com uh, companies are a little bit behind of that. So uh, Microsoft decided uh, to make a study how the transient attention span has changed. So they conducted the same study again, and uh, the results were not exactly what, what you might have expected. Because, let's play. It's after lunch, right? So the following text has exactly 140 characters. And that's the amount of text that fits into a tweet. You have 12 seconds to try to remember and read the content. Ready? OK. Take a deep breath. Focus. Ready? Ready? Yes. Good. Oh, shit, that was the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> this is the right one. Got it? The source for that is the Microsoft Surface Pro uh, user guide published in September last year. It's one paragraph in the user guide. So, have you managed to read and remember it in 12 seconds? At least read it to the end and remember it. Okay, it was a little bit unfair. It was only eight seconds. <laughs> so what were those 140 characters that you read, read in eight seconds about? What did you remember? Resolution. What was the resolution size? Okay, okay. Sorry? What can you do with that device? <laughs> HD movies, browse the web, and so on. So we had a 12.3-inch uh, display, we had a 3.2 aspect ratio, we had that resolution, we had can watch HD movies, browse the web, and use your favorite apps. Six different... Uh, informations in 140 characters, but we're not really able to catch that up. So the Microsoft study noticed that the transient attention span went down from 12 to 8 seconds in just 10 years. Okay, they were only interviewing Canadian people, that might make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> in the US it might be only 6 seconds. But uh, the intention impact factors that they found out was uh, the way the people uh, reacted to that the way they consumed media, the media consumption level and the amount of media they, that they consumed, the social media usage, and the technology adoption rate, and multi-screening behavior. So working with multi multiple screens like your desktop screen and your phone and your tablet and so on. So uh, the more technology agnostic the people were and the more technology they were using, uh, the lower their attention span was. So that tells us a lot about how we should present content to our customers. Uh, when we consider that we're talking to uh, the younger generation. Eight seconds. That's really not a lot. <laughs> so the attention span of a goldfish is even one second longer than the attention span of the millennials. Oops. So, who's on Twitter? You can tweet that. <laughs> millennials have an attention span shorter than a goldfish. Oh, that was the wrong hashtag, damn it. Yeah, that's the nice goldfish. And if you want to uh, tweet an image, you can use that one. 12 seconds in 2000, 8 seconds in 2013.
and the goldfish, nine seconds. Okay. <laughs> We're duped. <laughs> so, the thing is, we're moving from drops to drips. Do you remember like 10 years you were producing these huge amount of documentations and you had a nightly build, creating a big drop of your documentation? But that's a little bit the thing of the past. And we are moving from drops to content chunks, smaller content chunks. And from these content chunks, we're moving to snippets, content snippets, small snippets, because we need to display them everywhere on mobile devices, web pages, maybe even in a head-up uh, display from a car, on an augmented reality uh, um, glasses, and so on. And from snips, we're even moving to drips, small content drips, just one sentence, a few characters, 140 characters, and so on. So we're moving from drops to drips. Now translate that into Polish, please. <laughs> <laughs> I would be interested in what that is on poli in Polish. Um, and we have no choice. So there's no inter uh, alternative to intelligent information in Information 4.0. When we're talking about how we present information in the future to our customers and considering all the channels that we are delivering, delivering the information to, we need intelligent information. So let's have a look at the requirements for intelligent inf information. It needs to be modular. It needs to be structured. And yeah, that means XML and not Word or plain text or whatever. It needs to be semantic. Of course, we also need XML for that. It needs to be metadata rich. So we need to enrich the information with metadata. And it needs to be attributed with attributes like platform, audience, whatever. It needs to be autarkic or self-containing information. There's this sentence of uh, Mark Baker brought that up. Uh, Every page is page one. Uh, so when the customer arrives there, he needs that information and he don't want to see the information before that or after that. Maybe he wants to travel there uh, after reading it, but in the first place he just wants to read that information and he wants to get the information that he needs on this just one page. And it needs to, needs to be presentation neutral. We can do that easily with XML. And we need to make sure that our content can be consumed by both bots and humans. If we think of chatbots and the way people ask questions uh, to help systems in the future, it needs to be consumable by machines or by algorithms or whatever. And of course, we also need to, pr need to present it to humans. So be clear and personal and relevant and quickly get to the point because you do not have a lot of time. Uh, and leverage rich media, video, audio, 3D. So where's Anton from TechSmith? Ah, there he is. Talk to him, uh, because they have great solutions for video, to create videos, and then you, then you can embed them in your technical documentation and show uh, the people a video instead of writing a long abstract. Or maybe present even both informations. Uh, and start building cohesive, immersive content experiences across all channels, because one channel, like paper or PDF or only web or whatever, is not enough anymore. We need to present the information on all channels and let the customer decide where he wants to consume it, and start building tailored, personalized, dynamic content. That Philips thing is not personalized, it's not nice, it's not connecting, it doesn't create a great customer experience, it just creates customer frustration. So we don't want to have that and present it to our customers. And make it dynamic content, let the customer filter the information that he wants to see, that he wants to read, by adding checkboxes, you can easily do that with the Adobe products. So tag your content and uh, make it dynamic and let the user filter what he wants to see. And the customer decides when and where and how he consumes your content. So publish it to all channels. I hear this discussion on conferences all the time, like PDF is dead, or paper is dead. Or, and then the next one says, yeah, no, but we have to re uh, ship uh, on paper because of uh, blah, legal requirements or whatever. So let's stop that discussion about what channel we provide Let's just provide to all channels and let the customer decide where and when and how he wants to consume the content. Um, <coughs> let me give you an example uh, how we can do that with DIDA. So this is a DIDA hazard statement and um, that's a root element and a uh, root element for the hazard statement. And it has an ID like one, two, three, four, five 
an attribute importance, which is high, and an attribute translate, which is yes. So in that, we will provide one hazard statement and tailor it down to multiple channels and devices. So here we have in the hazard statement the message panel. And in the message panel, there is a platform attribute. That's Dida. This, all, this XML is all Dida. And uh, the platform is car display, and the audience is the driver. And the type of hazard is slow down, and how to avoid slow down to 100 kilometers per hour maximum to avoid accidents. So that's one message panel in our hazard statement, and it's targeted to the driver of a car. Same content, message panel, platform is, in this, uh, this case, the GPS bike computer, and the audience is the cyclist. Type of hazard, again, slow down, slow down to 30 kilometers per hour maximum to avoid penalties. And the third one, the message panel is, in this case, the, pl uh, the platform is the smartwatch, like an Apple watch or whatever, a sports watch maybe, and the audience is the runner. Again, slow down and how to avoid slow down to 10 kilometers per hour maximum to avoid health problems. So what we can do there, we have the same content there and uh, store it in one content chunk and any content delivery server could just pull out the relevant messaging from that XML based on the attribution like platform and audience and uh, yeah, platform and audience. So when, when the content delivery server is delivering the message to the bike computer, it can pull out platform smartwatch and uh, or, uh, GPS bike computer, and when it's delivering it to the um, Apple Watch or so, then it can deliver it to the smartwatch uh, with the audience runner based on that attribution. Okay, that's XML, that's Dida. And uh, of course, you can manage that in nice visual Visivic editors like Adobe Framemaker or the XML documentation add on for the Adobe Experience Manager. Let me give you a second example the GoPro, the Hero 5 user manual. And that's one that I really like. Uh, their marketing is really cool. GoPro is a very modern, cool company. They have great marketing, great community marketing. Uh, it's very action driven, fast paced, uh, very cool. And um, this is how their website looks like, or looked a few days ago. And let's look at their technical documentation. I didn't write technical communication. So let's have a look at the GoPro Hero 5 user manual, which is available only as a PDF. I like PDF, no question, I'm from Adobe, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just one channel. So this is how it looks like. It doesn't really look that bad. So at least they have some colorful uh, numbers, but you have to see, oh, that one, what is that one? Uh, I have to look down there, it's the shutter button, okay. And so on. So that's the classic way of uh, technical documentation. And uh, let's have a closer look at their getting started guide uh, from the Hero 5 user manual. And they welcome the user, the customer, with welcome to your new Hero 5 black. That's nice, isn't it? It's a nice welcome. It's a little bit enchanting, and they try to connect with the customer and welcome him. And the second sentence, to capture video and photos, you need a micro SD card. Sold separately. That's the second sentence after the welcome messaging. Great communication. So uh, when you download that PDF, you get that. It's a double facing pages on one PDF page um, with page numbers, eight and nine, and so, so yeah, is that fun to read on a mobile device, for example? Not really. Uh, what you need for that is responsive HTML5 output or create a mobile app or so. But that is not a great customer experience for, uh, for the technical documentation there. So let's have a look at how they could do it better by blending marketing and technical communication together and put the help content on the, on the web page. So they could build something like that. That's, of course, just a very rough draft and probably not the best web design, but just to give an idea of what you can do. Uh, so there could be a help page header, and then they could have the help page content, and then they could have placed right next to that marketing content. Uh, marketing content can be anything like community content, uh, forum messages, Twitter feeds, whatever. And let's look how that could look like then. So they could uh, use that nice imaging that they have there, like getting started, charging the battery, getting started, and then they present the content there. And uh, the getting started title there 
That's uh, pulled out from the DIDA title, from the DIDA topic, and charging the batteries the subtitle. So they could pull in the content uh, from their technical documentation on the website. And on the right side, they could uh, place some marketing content to make the whole, uh, page, the whole page look nicer. And now imagine what kind of user experiences and customer stories that could create. So uh, you could place, place something like uh, the technical documentation part here on that side. And on this side, you place something like uh, a forum discussion where people discuss exactly how to replace the battery. Or you could uh, present uh, content like uh, how to mount a tripod. And on the right side, you have a link to the shop where, the, where people can buy a tripod from the accessory store. So blending the technical documentation and the marketing uh, uh, content together on one website is what companies start to do now. That's how it meshed up. Help page content based on DIDA, coming from the DIDA CSMS, and marketing content coming from the marketing content CMS and blend that together into one customer experience. Ooh. Let me introduce you to Adobe Experience Manager, uh, our new solution to blend marketing and technical communication content together. So what we have uh, is uh, the Adobe Experience Manager with uh, these classic modules for sites. Sites are uh, basically uh, the websites, uh, the components for the website. There's a full asset management for videos, um, audio, and so on. We have a communities module in there where people can uh, um, create user forums and uh, discussions and so on. There's a forms module for lead generation and contact forms and so on. And there's a mobile module where people can uh, create, or the users of Adobe Experience Manager, create mobile apps from their web content. But companies were coming to Adobe and said, we have that great website content management system. And we have some other content management system for our data content or technical communication content. And we have an asset management and blah, blah, blah. And we're, yeah, we don't want it anymore. We don't want to have 10, 20 systems. We want to have one solution, one platform where we can manage both the marketing content and the technical content. And companies, big companies like Intel or so, they say most of our content is technical content. And our customers are not so super interested in our marketing messaging. They're interested in the technical content. They want to read the technical data. They want to look into the manual because they are IT admins or whatever. And they want to look at the technical data and they want to get it there, read it there, confirm that uh, they make a right buying decision uh, based on facts and not on some marketing messaging, which is very blurry and uh, just exciting. So they said, we want to manage our technical content on that same platform. And so we said, okay, let's do that. And we added a TechCom module to that. It's called the XML documentation add-on for Adobe Experience Manager, where we built into Adobe Experience Manager a complete DIDA CCMS. And now you can manage both your classic marketing content and your DIDA-based, XML-based content on the same platform. So this, it's a platform to create and manage and publish both your marketing and technical content on this one platform. We call that blended communication. And this is how it looks like. So you have the Adobe Experience Manager as one platform, and you have some marketing content here and some marketing content there and another marketing content module there. And you have your TechCom content like a topic and a task and some data maps or whatever. And then you publish that onto your template from the website to website and mobile, and you just drag and drop the content from your content management system from the components to your template, put some marketing content there, put some tech con content there, put some another uh, data module there, and draw in a table with technical data from that topic into there and place some other marketing content around it, like a contact form or some help uh, links and so on. And then you can, j just by drag and drop, you can uh, pull out the technical content, the data topics, or even parts of that data topic onto your website template, and it automatically renders as a web page. That's pretty unique. So technical communication is marketing communication, because the customers want to get that uh, technical content, want to read it, want to understand it, want to confirm that they are right in their buying decision by getting that technical content. And then they, they don't want to stop there. They want to go on into the uh, 
buying process for their technical documentation. So let me uh, close that uh, with a quote from Shantanu um, Narayan, our CEO from Adobe. Be passionate and bold. Always keep learning. And if you stop doing useful things, uh, stop, you stop doing useful things if you don't learn. So that's uh, the messaging from our CEO. And I think that's perfectly fits for technical documentation and tech writers as well, uh, because we need to th change how we uh, communicate with our customers. Thank you. Thank you a lot for this not at all boring talk. <laughs> uh, I was joking, guys. I knew that uh, Stefan is going to uh, get us something interesting. Do you have questions? Yes, we do have questions here in the front. <clears throat> yeah, just a remark first. I'm going to steal one of your slides with the blending marketing and technical content because I should have done it, but now I know. Too late. <laughs> uh, question: uh, Can you so you're using the experience manager or what's it called? Uh, can you actually import stuff from other CMSs as well, or is it just just one off where you can import it from? Yeah. So there, there, there are these two parts. Uh, one is the classic website content. You can migrate that from other CM, web, web CMS systems, and the technical um, uh, content is, um, that's a DIDA CMS. So whenever you have any system or don't have a system at all, but just the DIDA files, you can just upload them to Adobe Experience Manager and continue working. So it's very as it's DIDA and uh, XML, it's very easy to do that. Even specialization is supported and so on. So that's not a deal. Anyone else? Yes, we do have here. This one question. There. Yeah, uh, we're waiting for the yeah, mic. Thank you. Does uh, the Microsoft research show uh, do customer age correlate to time for to attract them to the information? Mm, sorry, I don't get um, the question. Does the older people do? Do they don't they need to spend more information, more time to get information, not nine seconds? I think the young people they go and they read, they like on the, in a few seconds they de they decide do they like the information or not. That's that's probably the th uh, core of it. So the, um, the main thing is you have these eight seconds to catch the attention from someone uh, for um, bringing your message to him. After that, if he's interested. Uh, then he gets into the focused attention span, and there he has about 20 minutes to consume the content and understand it and deal with it. But these eight seconds are mostly for um, catching the first attention, uh, first attention, and you only have these eight, eight seconds. And as you saw in that one tweet, it's not much. Everything. So it's even, I would say it's even, if we can drive that very forward and say, okay, uh, think of a car. And you're driving the car and the red lamp starts to blink. And uh, you have eight seconds to communicate with the driver of the car maximum uh, before he loses the attention of that. And then he says, ah, I will just ignore that red lamp, right? And drive on. But if you have a small head-up display in the car and have one core messaging, one quick sentence, okay, all is running empty or whatever, I'm not a big red lamp uh, expert, but <laughs> um, you need to uh, deliver that message uh, very quickly to write in place where the uh, customer is, in the situation where he is, in place information, and then he uh, gets that messaging and you can communicate with him. But you don't have much more time than that. One more question. Thank you. So you presented a technological solution, um, but do you think that um, before this, there's um, some merging of departments happening in the company, like before actually getting to the website and presenting information next to each other. Talk to me about that. Uh, I know even at Adobe, uh, we sometimes still have these silos uh, with marketing people and technical uh, documentation people. And it's, it's, it, there has to be culture change in the company uh, where people start to talk to each other more. And marketing in some companies, um, the big companies that, like which I mentioned, um, they start to understand now that the technical documentation is becoming part of their marketing and they see it as part of their marketing 
and marketing strategy today. So of course they need to talk to each other. And uh, recently I uh, had someone saying, yeah, that's not interesting for me because we don't do marketing. We do technical documentation and that's a very serious thing. Technical uh, documentation becomes a marketing asset then. In this that's case. it, yeah. But once, once companies start to understand that their technical documentation becomes a marketing asset and that people make buying decisions ba based on that, I had that example uh, when I bought a camera from Sony, a pocket camera. And uh, I looked up on Amazon, of course, uh, about all the models, and uh, I looked at some um, um, uh, photo newspapers where they had uh, compar uh, comparisons between cameras, and I downloaded, or tried to download, uh, the manual from the Sony webpage. And uh, then I looked into that and I wanted to see how, I, how can I make a selfie or whatever and um, <laughs> with that camera. And uh, I thought, nah, that's so complicated to transfer my photos from the camera to my iPhone, I will not buy that camera. And I bought a different one, which had a more better connector between the systems. Interoperability is the topic there. So I made my buying decision based on the technical documentation and I even made a negative buying decision in this case and decided to go for a different model, which had a provided in the technical documentation the information that I wanted to have to make that decision. Okay, we don't have any time anymore, right? Or? We still do have. Okay. Do you guys have? Okay, we have one more question here. Um, just a question and remark. Uh, don't you think that it's a challenge to make marketing people use data or technical communication uh, uh, targeted tools because they usually operate in a totally different tooling ecosystem like it's not it's not only a problem of silos it's like totally different uh, work cycle and yeah um, there are two things about that on the one hand uh, you still have that classic uh, website mm -hmm. marketing module uh, where marketing people can create their um, and curate their uh, marketing content the way they know it and the tech writer can work with data mm -hmm. Um, but there are also com uh, companies like IBM who say uh, we want to even move all of our marketing content to Dida, right? So not everyone wants to do that, of course, um, and sometimes today it's very difficult to do that, and for marketing people it's difficult to understand Dida. Uh, but in the end it's a question of the tool. So for, for example, in Adobe Experience, Manager, uh, Adobe Experience Manager, there's a very simple web editor just reduced super totally, you don't see any code, any tags or whatever, uh, and you just type it in like you would do in a very simplified word editor. So they don't even know that it's data. They can just type in their content there, and uh, or subject matter experts who contribute content, they can just use that simple editor, and the professional tech writer then, or content curator, or information architect, he can then use that content and uh, continue to work on it and professionalize it and enrich it with metadata and attribution and so on. Okay, so, so basically it's just a matter of, of implementing content strategy uh, Absolutely. To make it work, yeah. Yeah, okay. abs definitely. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Good question. We can afford one more question if you have it. Every more question is $10 then. <laughs> <laughs> you can still talk to Stefan um, well, during the, the whole day today, and hopefully he joins the pink corner definitely. for like the next yeah. 15 minutes. So if you want to talk to him uh, face to face, you can do that. Thank you a lot, Stefan. Thank you.